balance. And I, I really believe that that has to be balanced against whether this individual sitting next to that other person is the right candidate, the right person for the parole board. And I think to just count her as a prosecutor without knowing who she is as a person and not addressing her as a person is a mistake. And I think that it would be a loss to the parole board. So thank you for allowing me to give you some information about the parent that I know. I have known her for over 20 years, hard to believe, and I am confident that if given the opportunity to serve on the parole board, she would do so with fairness and reason. I first encountered Karen when I interned at the district attorney's office in 1998 as part of the Victim Witness Advocate Program. As part of my duties, I was able to observe attorneys during all types of proceedings, and it wasn't long before Karen became someone I recognized as a great example. A student of the law, she sought to be fair in her prosecution of cases. I observed her in and out of the courtroom during trials, motions, and other hearings as she interacted with members of the public, attorneys, judges, and other court staff. She may not have agreed with everyone she encountered, but she was always respectful in all of the dealings. She made it a point to always listen to those around her. She never prosecuted a case just for the sake of prosecuting a case, and she assessed each one on its own merits. When I rejoined the district attorney's office as a young prosecutor, Karen was quick to offer a listening ear to me. I recall, I recall bringing her cases to discuss. After I had done my research and prepared my case, she would sit with me as we engaged in discussions, looking at all aspects of my cases and potential issues. She was and is incredibly smart, consistently prepared, competent, and open to questions and different points of view. I cannot remember a time that I didn't bring Karen an issue or a question when she didn't listen with openness and respect. I know that my colleagues enjoyed a similar relationship with Karen. We all lined up outside her door with questions, but she never, she didn't give us the answers. Instead, she would ask us the questions, helping us to see different aspects of our cases and allowing us to make decisions for ourselves. Now, years later, as an assistant clerk magistrate, I continue to have the opportunity to observe Karen in and out of the court on a daily basis, and I can say that she is sharper than ever. Deservedly so, she has earned the respect of judges, attorneys, and court staff. That is because Karen has always made it a point to exercise good judgment, to be fair and candid in her approach to people, cases, and situations. She has never lost sight of the fact that behind each case, each docket number are people and families in impossible situations. I watch as she interacts with members of the public, attorneys, judges, and other court staff, and she has maintained her openness and willingness to hear other points of view. She welcomes discussion. She is courteous, professional, and above all, fair in her dealings with others. This is the Karen that I know. I am confident that Karen will bring these same attributes to the parole board, and for these reasons, I wholeheartedly support her nomination. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, just one. When did you become the assistant clerk? I've been there for three years. Thank you. Angel, by the way, uh, has received raves from all of the judges and the other personnel in the Springfield District Court. <coughs> Very professional, uh, just top-notch job you've done in handling any situation. Councilor Juvenville. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you seem upset with us. I'm not upset at all. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, I think you have an uh, incredibly difficult job to do, and I, uh, I've been listening, and I am encouraged by the rigorous debate and the passion and the commitment that you all have shown. It's not a personal thing, Chair. Um, and we don't know the nominees sometimes. A lot of times I do. I've been at the courts for 47 years, so I'll know people. And I have dealt with them over the years. But sometimes I don't know people, so I have to listen to, you know, I have to, but I have to li like listening to witnesses for and against. And um, I think Benny, Benny's a wonderful <coughs> lawyer. I respect him immensely. Jen is a wonderful judge. And uh, I don't know you, but you seem pretty 
every square way and good talker. And I believe everything you say. But most people that I don't know that get nominated for these high positions, they come to the council and they tell us what we want to hear. They try to, I mean, how many times have we asked people how they're going to behave? And they're like, oh, I believe that. That comes to me. Six months later, I'm in a court and people go, oh. I go, how did I get that wrong? So I don't know how to to get beyond that, there's no way to get it right or wrong, I guess. Uh, and I wanted to make it plain and clear. I, I don't know this lady personally. I have no animosity against her. I, I think she, from all accounts, I will take every good thing said about her. To me, it's a bigger question. It's, it's just a bigger question. And the perception of that, all the people that are taking time to come in here, people that have emailed me and all the counselors, there's a bigger issue here. You know, and I meant that when I said the world is changing both politically and in other ways. And uh, I think the perception for the parole, the parole board, the, the releases, the uh, paroles, other than a couple of people on that parole board, are way down. And that's got to stop. And, and I guess I don't know how to make it stop other than my vote. And I hope it's the right one sometime. And, 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 I, and, if, and if this nominee gets the votes and gets in, I don't, I don't say anything bad about her. I hope she succeeds. And I hope I can say to her two years from now or a year from now, I, my vote was wrong. You've done a hell of a job out there. And I mean that because I, I voted against judges who I see a year or two later, and I say, "I'm glad you made you made me wrong." I'm glad of that because the people of the Commonwealth are better off because of the way you're acting. So again, it's not about her; it's about the perception that that I, as an elected official, have to go out into the community that. That votes for me. I, I have to let them know that I'm not thinking. And I understand that perception is something that to be, and I think it should be something that's announced. I do not think it should be the only thing announced. I, um, I didn't come here lightly, and I had the unique, I've been in a unique position to have interacted in, with Karen in the courtroom with attorneys, <coughs> with judges, with members of the public for a long period of time. So that gives me the ability to see if Karen changes, if she becomes, because we, we work in Springfield, which as you know is one of the busiest courts in, in, in the Commonwealth, which has, which can make people jaded, which can make people um, start to look at people as just a case and forget that there are people and individuals and families behind those cases. So I'm in a unique position to see that. And I wouldn't be here because I do think that access to justice is extremely important. So I wouldn't be here if I didn't see Karen on a daily basis and see that she's maintained that. She's maintained her ability to look at things at a case-by-case -case basis. So I do agree that perception is important, but I think you miss an opportunity if you don't, if, with this woman. I think she's the right person to see, and I wouldn't be here if I didn't. Have you ever been to the parole board? I have not. Have you ever seen what parole board members do? I have not. That, I have not. Okay. How they make their decisions? No, I've been to courtrooms, though, where people are making decisions well, I mean about freedom board. every day. I mean the parole board. Do you say she's ready for the parole board? It should be good. You really don't have any background in what goes on. Right. So, yes. <clears throat> but I think that you know, it's tough to say that she's going to be, and I, you know, I know that you speak very highly of her in your interactions with her, and I appreciate that. And I, and I believe everything you said to me. But if I said to you, uh, you know, I'm recommending this fella here to fix your plumbing in your house. And you said to me, well, do you know anything about plumbing? And I said, no. And you'd say, well, how, how do you know he can do the job? You follow, you follow what I'm saying? I do. I do. Uh, and, and it's a different job on the parole board than being a district attorney. An assistant district attorney is very different. You go out to each of the jails all around the Commonwealth and state prisons and hearings and it takes a lot of guts to say to someone in a room full of people this big sometimes, I'm going to vote for you to get people. It takes a lot of guts. So, anyway, I, I do appreciate what you said.
Councilor Ayanella. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, coming here. I appreciate it. To me, it's not about perception. To me, it's about reality. I look at that pool over there. To me, it's overwhelming law enforcement. And that's too much for me. It's too much. You know, I wanted people on the parole board who have training in psychology, psychiatry, social worker. You know, that's what I look for. And that's what I want, and I'm going to insist on. I want people who understand addiction. I want people on that parole board who understand mental health issues. I don't want members of that parole board who are, in this case, overwhelmingly law enforcement. You know, you, you just answered Councilor Julio. You know, you're not that familiar. I thought you said with the parole board. But I hear so many stories. You know what happens at the parole board hearings? They rehash the crime. We've already had the crime. I want people who can understand integrating these prisoners back into society. Rehabilitation. That's what I'm about. So when I look and hear, and I read her credentials, you know what? Maybe another time she'd be someone I would vote for. But not a situation where the parole board is all or mostly a predominantly law enforcement. That's my thought. Uh, so I appreciate you coming here. But at least you have, have a better understanding, at least where I'm coming from. Thank you. All right, anyone else? All right, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Excuse us. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, I do want to tell you that um, I have tried to change the parole board, and I work with Representative Balzer, and we made some changes. We do have someone that can identify uh, mental issues of inmates and drug addictions and all that, but it stopped. It didn't go any further, and because the people coming in, council are voting for them, we have gone backwards. And so um, it, it isn't about Karen. It's about, you know, we have to change the parole board in a different direction. And if we don't, it's not fair to people who are incarcerated or looking for, you know, a, another life. And, and it, it's not going to happen unless we, unless this council, and I'm hoping this time that they will come forward. And it's not easy. It's not, I found it's not easy to do the right thing. But sometimes you have to do that right thing. So I appreciate you. You, you wonderful, beautiful. I, I really appreciate everything that you said. And thank you for your service, what you do. But I think you have to understand we have to change the makeup of the parole board. And if we keep on doing, if they keep on doing this, you know, what's that saying? If we keep on doing the same thing over and over. So anyway, but thank you for coming. I, I, I don't want to demean you. I appreciate you, really. Anyone else? Um, thank you very much. OK. <clears throat> In any event, um, you heard from the witnesses that were proposed by the nominee. And partly in response to your statements, Mr. Councilor Ayanella, I'm going to read a letter from Christopher Bernier, who is a licensed social worker and who is the person who works in the drug court. He's the drug court clinician in Camden County. I'm writing this letter in support of Karen McCarthy's nomination to the parole board. As the drug court clinician for Hamden County, I have worked closely with Karen on several drug court projects that include screening, collaboration, and policy formation. Karen is an integral member of the team and has a vast systems approach and a global understanding of the issues our population faces and is up to date on many treatment options. She has worked with her office to supply birthday cards to her participants, rewards good behavior, and holds the team accountable to the sanctions that need to be imposed. She's been very fair, consistent, and supportive of recovery. I would not hesitate to support her nomination to the parole board. Should you have any questions, please don't hesitate to call me and he provides the number. Each of the counselors has been provided with a copy of that letter. 
And I would ask that a letter also be included in the file um, by our assistant, George. And I would invite anyone from the public who wants a copy of this letter to please uh, take it at the uh, conclusion of the hearing. In addition, I have a letter here from uh, the offices of Joseph Bernard, who is a, a statewide known attorney was handled numerous cases uh, as a defense attorney who started off as a prosecutor with Karen some 20 years ago. He indicates that he has uh, seen her as a care parent and involved mother, has a professional relationship with her as she served as a prosecutor in Hammond Superior Court and her subsequent role as a supervising prosecutor in Springfield District Court. It has never once interfered with her representation as a zealous advocate for the Commonwealth. She is go-to for prosecutors, judges, and other lawyers regarding case law, procedure, protocol, and rules of evidence. Karen's assessment of cases is not only true, thorough, but balanced. She's always willing to listen to genuine mitigating circumstances. When Karen has been a supervisor for the last five years, there are many cases that mandate an experienced lawyer's assessment. Karen's ability to read a case and understand the totality of circumstances is second to none. She can identify weakness, weaknesses and strengths as well as the human factors that shape the case and ultimately the recommendations. He, uh, without qualification or hesitation, um, sorry folks, he would, uh, without qualification or hesitation, recommends her disposition. And that's from the defense attorney. Uh, I've also gotten numerous calls. At this time, would ask if there's anyone else who would like to speak on behalf of Karen McCarthy's nomination. Hearing none. Excuse me. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, providing those letters. I would like to also read a letter that I received. If it's in support of the No, it's, it's not in support. You're, You're going to have your chance in a minute. Okay. okay. Right. I thought, okay, I'm sorry. That's all right. Uh, in any event, are you asking to speak in support of? Yes. All right, come on down and identify yourself. I haven't been sworn in, so it's like this. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth as it relates to the matter now we hear from the witness. I do. Give us your name, please. Absolutely. My name is Tom Prendergast. I'm an assistant district attorney in Hamden County and have been for five years in the five years I've been on Attorney McCarthy. Attorney McCarthy was my uh, first supervisor and first real boss uh, in the legal world. Uh, she was my supervisor in my position uh, working in district court. And Is the mic they can't hear you. You have to talk about the mic. A little yeah. close. Like this. Yeah. Does that work? I have worked uh, closely with Karen for the past five years, and I want to stand up and take the opportunity to speak for the character of the person that Attorney McCarthy is. I think that uh, in listening to this, I did not uh, come prepared. I did not come expecting to, uh, to give any testimony on uh, Karen's behalf. However, I think it's important that the board take the time to consider the character of the person that's sitting before them. Uh, I recognize that uh, there has been a great deal spoken about the fact that Karen is a prosecutor. And I would suggest to the, to, the, to the council, and I have nothing but the utmost respect, and, and I, I understand the, the, uh, the magnitude and importance of your positions. I do just want to take this opportunity to suggest to the board to consider not modeling the behavior that you would not want to see on the parole board. I would hate to see a decision made by uh, the honorable council uh, here based on the simple fact that Karen is a prosecutor, because Karen is so much more than that. I can speak uh, to the fact that I, I came to her as a brand new attorney, not knowing uh, what what recommendations should be made on cases, not knowing how to handle uh, prosecuting uh, anybody, really. And one of the hardest things in our position as an assistant district attorney, especially a brand new one, is finding a way to recommend a sentence or to recommend probation or to see those cases where 
and say, this isn't worth our time, it's not worth prosecuting, this person deserves a second chance. And I can say without fail that Karen has always had the character of seeking out justice and seeking out the right thing before seeking out a news headline, doing something that would have been politically proper or doing something that would have been unpopular to a group of people. I heard uh, one of the counselors, uh, one of one of the counselors uh, say something. I apologize, I don't remember who, but I have no doubt in my mind knowing Karen and having those tough <coughs> conversations on who uh, deserves to be incarcerated and who deserves uh, probation or who deserves to have a second chance or who deserves to be reprobated in the violation of probation session. I can say without fail that Karen has the character to stand up and to look a room, to look at a, a room full of people that want somebody to, to, to not get paroled, to stay in prison. She absolutely has the character and backbone necessary to make a decision to parole someone if that's the right thing. The idea that she's a prosecutor and won't parole people is just not the person that she is. It does not speak to her character. And I can say that because I've had those conversations with her. I've been in that room sitting there asking, what do you think about this? I think this person deserves to go to the House of Correction. And she has looked me in the eye, sat down, and said, you're wrong. That person deserves a second chance. That person is not the kind of person that needs to be incarcerated. And my five years with her are the attorney I am is because of the conversations I had with her where she was able to say, this is going to be an unpopular decision, but that person deserves the opportunity. So I, I would just like the, the board to know that she has that character and that I hope that that is a bigger deciding factor to the council than the fact that she happens to come before the, uh, the council as a prosecutor. Thank you for, for taking the time to listen yes, to me. I appreciate you coming up. It was, uh, I, I, sitting in the back of the room and seeing your friend uh, uh, in a little trouble and uh, just stood up and defended I appreciate that. And I just want to say something. I don't think anybody on this council is attacking her character. Um, I don't think that's what the issue is at all in terms of this particular nomination. I think we all recognize that she's been a de dedicated public servant. That is not the issue that we have. And I said before, I have an open mind. I have not made up my mind on her nomination. I really mean that. Um, and the people who know me would say that's the truth. But um, it's 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 a bigger issue than her as a person. It's about the makeup of the board. That's what it is. If she was sitting here today up for a, a judgeship and who she were, there wouldn't be Five people in the room, there'd be five people in the room saying support her, and I'd already be voting for her. And I think most of the people in this council would be voting for her. Uh, it's not about her as a person, it's about the makeup of the board. That's what it is. I just want to be clear about that. Absolutely. If I could just respond, I, I, I want to make that clear to the entire council that I did not mean to, to, to say that anybody is attacking her character. I'm just, I was just suggesting to the board that I think that her decision. The, the concern is what decision she's going to make when she's actually on the parole board. And I think that the character that she presents to this board is, is that of a person that is going to make sure that the people that deserve parole, the people that come before and do the work and, and present as good opportunities for parole, that she would absolutely do that. And, and I understand that. But it's, it's about the body itself. Okay. Obviously, a lot of people have a lot of concerns. I'm going to listen to her. I'm going to ask her some questions. I'm going to leave it there. It was very brave of you to come up. I'm proud of you for doing that. I'm looking forward to your application in about five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to re reiterate what Council Kennedy said, and then I want to ask you a couple of questions. Um, I, I think that people don't maybe fully grasp, I, again, this is not a personal thing, but this parole board in the last few years has really slipped away from what it's supposed to be and what it's supposed to be doing. And it's become, in my opinion, a very serious public safety issue. Now, I'll leave that at that. And I want to ask you a couple questions about um, the applicant. So it, you would say in your professional relationship with her, that she always uses good judgment? Only the best judgment. She There's only uses the best judgment. And would you say she's fair? Incredibly. Incredibly fair. And would you say that she puts individual citizens' rights above what is best for the district attorney's office? Absolutely. The 
this, her, her goal was always a fair and just outcome for the individual that was named in the case. It was never for the headline and never for uh, protecting. Uh, never for protecting the district attorney's office. Never. Okay. Thank you. In, in my in my perfect in my time with her, that was never a conversation to be had. Great. <clears throat> Real quick, yes, sir, I know. Uh, you did a great job, especially where I, at least I might have the impression you were not here to be committed. Had no intention to say, of coming down in this chair. Didn't want to. You did a 10 job. You should be proud. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I think we have too many prosecutors. One question. If she were a defense attorney, I'd be voting no. So I know you said prosecutor. I want people with social science background. That's what we need. Okay, that's where I'm coming from. Okay, people who can understand addiction, who can understand mental health issues. I, you know, clerk, a defense attorney, prosecutor. I don't want those people. I want someone who has a social science background on the parole board. We need more of those people. More of them. That's where I'm coming. From. I respect your position. Thank you. So if I find work for me because I got a degree in sociology, consider consider you. Okay. In any of Oh, wait a minute. You're a judge. No. <laughs> <laughs> kidding. Kidding. And if you ask people, they'll tell you I was, I was giving people second chances all the time. Because that's what the district court is on second chances. Um, I think I've known you since you were working behind the ears. I think he still is. A little bit. But I think you did a great job today. I know that you didn't. Basically, come down here to do that. You did a splendid job. Um, and uh, it might take more than five years, but I'm sure that this, if I'm not here, we're going to see you here at some point in time in the future. So I thank you very much. All right. Thank you for your Anyone time. else who wishes to speak in favor of the nominee? All right. I'm going to declare that portion of the hearing closed. I'm going to indicate that I have a list here of 17 people. Who wish to speak in opposition? Actually, 16 people. Um, who wish to speak in opposition? In um, doing the math, if every witness gets asked half the questions that have been asked of the other witnesses who've already testified, we're going to be here till Christmas. I want everybody to have the opportunity. Counselor, please. I'm. I want everybody to have the opportunity to speak. I've indicated that I asked everybody don't speak for more than five minutes. However, I, out of respect for my fellow counselors, I cannot limit their questions or their comments. So if we do not finish by 4 o'clock today, I'm going to continue this hearing to next Wednesday. There's nothing else scheduled. We can start, up. I'm going to tell you, we're going to start at 11 o'clock. And we are going to start at 11 o'clock. Point of order with respect to that. Yep. What is the 30 days of the deadline? Oh, um, I don't know. Actually, that matters. It does matter. We may have to do that. Oh, I'll just keep saying it. We, get it done keep saying we have to vote done. within 30 days. Let's get it done. Okay. okay. So if we, if we agree, that at the conclusion of the hearing, we would have an assembly on the 26th, it's within the 30 days. Yes, it would, we, there is precedent for that. There right. is precedent to take a vote if, if the hearing has extended more than one week at the end of the session. Okay. So, so you, just, you as chairman, have the ability to do that. Right. There is precedent for it. So just, can I just correct this up? If we meet next week at 11, yes. okay, hypothetically, and we go until 3, 4 o'clock, because we don't know. Right. What are you saying? Is the lieutenant governor going to? Are you saying the lieutenant governor and the governor votes? And the governor. She can anyway. call them if she wants. Okay, but I, that's what I know. I agree. Yeah. But my question is this: Is the lieutenant governor and the governor? Because we all know what the votes going to be. Are they both going to be available? If they're not, we should stay today. Can you follow me? If they're not going to be both be available next week. Yes. We should continue to today. Well, I'll yeah, stay here till nine o'clock. I would too, Councilor. You and I. We'll go out I'm, I'm a niner. I'll I'm a nine. Councilor, um, with all due respect, it's the chairman's decision. 
totally agree with you. I agree. Right, right. Totally agree. And frankly, and I understand what you're getting to if there's a tie, we can even break the tie, but that really isn't our concern. It's, oh, I understand, it, it's not my concern whether they hear or not. My concern is just to do my job. My only concern is, but I raised the issue because if we don't lose vote within 30 days, she's automatically on. And I think everybody here should have a right to vote. I absolutely That's agree. my point. But I so remember that. I am willing to come back on Tuesday. I'm willing to come back on Monday. Yeah, why, why can't we stay and see how far we get? I'll, I'm going to hear as long. I have something tonight, but forget it. This is just, more important. As long as it takes, we should be I, here today. I just want to make it clear for people in the audience. Under the law, we have 30 days from the date of nomination to vote for the nominee and vote against the nominee. If we take no action, she's automatically appointed. Okay? And that's why I raised the issue. Because if we continue this hearing, the folks go on too long. And we don't get it done in time, we don't even get the book. Good the point, Charles. Yeah, look, at, Good here's point. the deal, folks. I, I said five minutes for each of you, okay? I cannot control the counselors and their questions. So the counselors control the, the destiny here. If we do everybody and you stick to five minutes or less, we can do it today. But, but I don't can't. want to cut I don't want to cut anybody off, and I do not want anybody to feel that they have actually changed. I'm willing to come back any other day. Um, but let's get started. Anybody who wishes to speak in opposition. Excuse me, you said I could read my letter. Sure. At the end. Thank you. <laughs> I want to get these people through. And you can do it when it's Patricia Guerin. <laughs> Good afternoon, counselors. Um, I'm not going to say nearly everything I wanted to because I want to respect the timing here and get things through. I think something that everybody is focusing on is this is a prosecutor, and some of you mentioned it's not that she's a prosecutor. And frankly, what it is is it's who she is not. It's not that she is a prosecutor. It's that she is not a behavioral scientist. She is not a social worker. She is not a sociologist. She does not bring those skills to the board. And those skills are so badly, badly needed on this board. If you go to a parole hearing and you watch a hearing, Dr. Charlene Bonner is the only psychologist that we have. The quality of the hearing when she is asking questions is so not even comparable to when other people are asking questions. Because she understands mental health. She understands cause and effect. She understands how long and how intense rehabilitative work needs to be. She understands risk assessments. She can look at a risk assessment and say, no, that person is not a good risk. And she can put it into evidence, into words, and make it work. And make the person who she's talking to understand it. So the clients actually feel like when she's talking to them, they are getting instruction on what they need to do to get better, to get parole. She's the only person that does that out of the board. We need more people with that background to raise the quality of the hearings. And it isn't just raising the quality of the parole hearings that we need, because I think raising the quality will probably boost the parole rates. I don't know that, but I, I think it likely will, because there'll be more direct evidence but that's not what I'm about here. I'm about improving the quality of the hearings and improving the quality of how the board functions. And by that I mean, when the board is dominated by law enforcement, they conduct themselves in a certain way and they ignore certain parts of their job. There is a reason this parole board has not sent on a pardon, a commutation hearing, or anything to you in three and a half years since Paul Trusted became the chair. They have not forwarded one. They sent in a public records request. Not only haven't they forwarded one on, they haven't even looked at them. I asked how many have been considered in the last three and a half years. And there are hundreds before them. We have filed, in the past three and a half years, we have filed 45 petitions to terminate parole. People who've been on parole for 30 years with perfect behavior, just a 
waste the money to keep these people on parole after all this time. Again, not addressed. Not rejected, just plain old not addressed. I'll send you a copy of the public records request that I sent you. We wait over a year for decisions from this parole board. When Dr. Barley was the chair, she got those decisions, decisions out within 60 days. That's what the statute anticipates, 60 days. She got them all out. They were lengthy decisions with recommendations for how people should change their conduct, which was needed to do to come comfortable. They were thoughtful. The decisions we get now are cookie cutter decisions. They're, in fact, they don't even have, to, I'll send you, send you some where you can tell they're cookie cutter decisions because they forget to change the person's name. It'll be Mr. X's decision, and down at the bottom, it'll say Mr. Y didn't meet this. Oh, hello. So all of that stuff is what happens when you have a board that isn't paying attention to the human service end of things. It isn't balancing all of this stuff and taking it into their day-to-day -day job. Not just going to pull more people, but improving the quality of the work, improving what that board does. That's what having somebody else on the board is all about. It's my time? No, we don't have Oh, okay. Like they, they used to in high school. I appreciate that. I was wondering if I was getting They just used it. Yeah. All right. It's like the legislature with their big clock going around. Um, so, I won't repeat all of that. I think that you all understand that. I am just beseeching you to understand what's going on. Every single vote is going to count in this case. We are going to be very close, I can tell, because we all know where everybody Head is leaning, and this is really important. This is incredibly important. We need to get a better parole board. It's not about defeating Ms. McCarthy. It is about getting a better parole board. That's it. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Pat, I do understand what you're saying because I I, I met with someone who works in the parole uh, system. And her job was to, as you know, Gloria Marone, who's been on three months and now she's the chair, she was the counsel. She was a counsel for the parole board. And the woman I talked with, her responsibility was to give uh, Gloria the uh, eligible, the, the inmates who were eligible for parole. She never did it. She didn't do the job. So I know. That's why I couldn't vote for her. There's no way. But she didn't even get interviewed. They called her. So that's what I'm saying. Where were you then? <laughs> the parole board is very dysfunctional. Well, I, really that, but I, I do know for a stand about that. And, it, and it's absolutely true. And we can thank Lori Ann for that. I agree Okay? With that. And now she's the chair. So I, I hope that you will get these people activated, that we've got to get the, the board, the commission, the, the, the governor's um, to uh, the governor's council to be able to vote for the chair. At least give us that, you know? Okay, thank you. Right, real quick, real quick. Oh. No, just real quick, no questions. Just, as you can see, I, when you heard me, I'm all about social science. We need psychologists, sociologists. That's my position as well. Thank you very much. Thank okay, you. and by way of reference to a letter, I know you all got a letter from Alejandro Ramos, criminal defense attorney.
like many people that have spoken in this room, I do not know this McCarthy. I have no personal experience with it. I think that the overall issue that I and other people are concerned about is again more law enforcement on the whole board. There are many people I get calls every week from lifers in particular nine one one that feel that they have not gotten a fair parole hearing based on their actual composition of their parole. I myself, my initial parole was by Maureen Walsh, who was a former prosecutor. The difference was Maureen Walsh came into the parole um, department with an open mind. And though initially she was stern, but she was fair. Ever since Maureen Walsh was chairman of Massachusetts Parole Board, as you know, it has de declined where people on second degree life, I was for uh, armed robbery, but for murder or anything else, they are not getting the actual type of parole hearing that they deserve. It's more about, someone mentioned it earlier, it's more about the retrying of the, of, of the crime, tripping people up on technical uh, detail of a crime. We just had two parole board hearings last week, and it was obvious that these people and there was background for um, revocation hearings, but there's their overall issues wasn't about crime or any kind of criminal conduct. It was for technical violation for drinking or substance abuse that was based on what self medication regarding their trauma from the lives that they took at the late ages. So my promotion is the same as Mr. I know that many of you know that it's about um, getting more people on board with the social science. I has nothing personal against her. But we need more people with a, a more a, a diverse background. We had the judge mention that even in parole, in their probation court, that they on the board, they have clinicians and everything that put input before they make a decision on anyone. The only person that's on the Massachusetts Parole Board is Ms. Charlene Barnard. And in that, you can tell when she, as uh, Ms. Garen mentioned, you can tell the difference. Right? And, and, and an individual, him, him feeling attacked, and, and be little and tra and be traumatized. And so when the judge mentioned about um, what he said, I wrote it down. He said um, having the casualties of a political process. What about the men and women behind the wall that are not being given fair parole and fair consideration for their parole eligibility because this parole board is now top heavy with law enforcement that just want to punish people and keep people locked up for a long period of time without looking at the extenuating circumstances of the trauma and the rehabilitative effort, or even going forward about what they need to continue their rehabilitation. So my advocacy is not against her, but this is about that we need to balance the parole board out with more clinicians and people with uh, social science background. Thank you very much. No questions? I just want to say I agree with you, and Charlene should have been put back as the chair.
school um, the way it should be has been determined by objective bodies like the New York State governments and other experts who are looking at the trends away from evidence-based practices and been looking at the statistics on plummeting for decades. Um, and part of the reason why I think many people in this room already know it's sort of this history of embracing reactionary, non-evidence-based uh, practices in response to isolated events like the Orton incident, Dr. Snelly incident, just how quickly we've gotten into this situation of incredibly low police rates um, and uh, law enforcement heavy parolling. Um, so the, the DOC parolling rate as assessed by the Council on State Government is somewhere around 38%, which is incredibly low. And uh, just to give you a, a comparison, in 1980, it was around 80%. And there are neighboring states in New, New England that are still up in that area. Um, and we've, we've plummeted um, quite a bit since then. And if you look at the numbers from 2009, so 78% of people who out on parole successfully completed parole in Massachusetts as compared to a national average of about 51%, meaning there was really no evidence-based reason to dramatically shift the way people are doing in Massachusetts. But nonetheless, that's what we've seen that's happened. Um, so the reactionary tough on crime policies are directly correlated, as many of you probably know, with over-incarceration, but also unsustainable correctional practice. And you could think about that as well. And that's why people across the country have turned to more cost-effective ways of doing criminal justice, including parole. Um, and have seen impactful outcomes as a result. So as you know, last session, uh, with widespread public support, this Commonwealth